jotted it down. But Psalm 26, I want to begin reading in verse number 1, and uh, we'll read through verse number 12, if you can, uh, stand for the reading of God's Word. The psalmist David, and it says it's a psalm of David. Now, you understand, uh, we talk about the psalmist David, and I think most of you understand that David did not write every psalm in the book of Psalms. It is a collection of psalms. David wrote the majority of them, but this is a psalm of David. The Bible says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, prove me, try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving, and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. How many, how many can have a fresh appreciation of that right now? Being able to come back to the house of God and sit in the house of God. He said, Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hand is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. He says in verse 1, I, walk, I have walked, and he says here, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, and the congregation will I bless the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray for these that have been given the prayer request. We do pray for Michael McDonald as he'll have uh, open heart surgery next Monday. And uh, in Alabama, I pray that you'll help him. I pray that you'll guide the doctor's hand. I pray also for the paint boy who passed away. Lord, we pray for this family uh, that you'll meet them. We thank you, Lord, for some uh, that are back with us tonight and uh, again and haven't seen them, Lord, in church because we know where they've been. But thank you, Lord, for them gathering back. And I long soon when all of our people will feel safe and feel like they can get back in the house of God and gather together and worship. And Lord, help us not to just Say, well, I, I'm going to wait till we have Sunday school, we have bus miss, we have everything before I come back. Because, Lord, uh, that may be a while. And uh, don't let things like that stop us, Lord. And I pray to you others not to stop us from getting back in the house of God. I never thought I'd have to buy groceries and a mask. Never thought I'd have to get my, my temperature checked before I went to see the dentist. We're living in different days than we've ever lived in before in our life. And so, Lord, help us just to realize these things and to go with them and be excited about the doors being open and being back in the house of God. I ask you to continue to keep our people safe from harm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to speak on this subject tonight, how to handle mistreatment. How to handle mistreatment. Let me ask you tonight, you don't have to raise your hand, but have you ever been mistreated? Or have you ever felt like somebody mistreated you? Some, perhaps, have been mistreated by a spouse, whether it be a husband or a wife. For some, it was your boss that mistreated you. Mistreatment can become a malignancy in your life if it's not handled correctly. It is generally agreed, and I think a lot of times when we read the Psalms, we do not understand completely, uh, without going back to study, the history or the circumstances behind this psalm. Let me give you a little bit of the history of the circumstances behind Psalm 26. It's generally agreed by scholars that this psalm was composed on an account of some injurious charge that was brought against David, possibly by some of Saul's men. Saul was the king. David was next in line to be the king. He was anointed. No, no doubt somebody had brought up some injuries, some slanderous charges against David. I guess that's the reason David says in verse number 1, I've walked in mine integrity, and in verse number 11, I will walk in mine integrity. This psalm was penned by David uh, when he was, uh, you might say, when he was in distress. And then particularly, 
probably when he was falsely accused or defamed or slandered by some of his adversaries. But I, having that and knowing the context of this psalm, David writes this psalm. Now, the truth of the matter is all the psalms show us the human emotion that we go through. If you want to know about emotion, you read the book of Psalms because you see the emotions that people go through. You see the emotion that the psalmist goes through as he pens these words. And I want to show you tonight from Psalm 26 what to do when you're mistreated. What to do maybe when somebody slanders you or somebody brings up an injurious charge against you. Now I want to notice I said what to do when. It's not if you get mistreated. I promise you, you will be mistreated. And if you have not been mistreated before now, and I doubt that's the case, you will be mistreated. You, some of us will be mistreated weekly. Some, some children are mistreated by their parents. And some parents, uh, uh, some children mistreat their parents. Sometimes a spouse is mistreated by a husband. And I, I, I can, I, I'll just say this, and I know it's so you too, but I know Ruth has said some things here recently. She said something like this. She said, I never knew you were supposed to be treated like this. With, with Caleb, I never knew that a husband was supposed to treat somebody like this. Well, th that just lets me know that probably there's been mistreatment somewhere or another. And, and here David is writing the song, and he's saying something along that line. He, he's saying, here's what I do when you're mistreated. He knows what it is to be mistreated. He learned how to properly handle it, and that's what we all need to learn. Did not Saul one time not once but twice threw a spear or javelin at him to pin him up against the wall. David knew what it was to be mistreated. And can I tell you, our life is too short to live it in bitterness. You say, how should I respond when you're mistreated? What should I do when I'm mistreated? Well, when you're mistreated, you might feel like the woman one day who was walking along the beach when she spotted a bottle on the sand. She picked it up and pulled out the cork and whoosh. A big puff of smoke appeared and there standing before her was a genie. He said, thank you for freeing me and to show you my gratitude, I will grant you three wishes. But with each wish, your husband will receive double what you request. And the genie asked her, said, do you understand? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, why would you do that? And uh, she said, uh, well, uh, she said, uh, I, 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 this is what I want. She said, and so she said, regardless of what you receive, your husband will receive double. No. So she said, I request that I receive a million dollars. There was a flash of light and a million dollars appeared at her feet at the same moment, miles away. Her husband received twice as much. He received two million. The genie said, now, what is your second wish? She said, I wish for the world's most expensive diamond necklace. Another flash of light, and she's holding the precious treasure. And far away, her husband was looking for a gem broker to cash his in because now he's got two. Finally, the genie said, you have one more request. The lady said, if it's really true that my husband now has $2 million and he has dual, uh, twice the amount of jewels that I do and that he gets double whatever I wish for, and the genie said, yes, ma'am, that's correct. She said, I'm ready for my last wish. And he said, what is it? He said, I want somebody to beat me half to death right now. <laughs> now, I believe that is a woman who has been mistreated. David knew what it was to be mistreated. And I want to show you from God's word how he responds so you won't have to be a prisoner when you're mistreated. Sooner or later, somebody's going to wrong you. Sooner or later, somebody's going to do something that upsets you. They'll hurt you deeply. They'll hurt you unfairly. But I want to show you how God wants you to handle mistreatment. And there are three things I find in this song. 
The first thing, when you're mistreated, examine yourself. Search continually yourself. Look what he says in Psalm 26, verses 1 through 3. David has been mistreated, but he's not asking anybody to deal with those that have mistreated him. He says, watch this. Judge me, O Lord, for I've walked in my integrity. I trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, prove me, and try my reins, my heart. What David is saying is, judge me, prove me, examine me, try me. Here's David, Brother Doc, he's been mistreated, and rather than pointing his finger at the one who had mistreated him, treated him he points at himself and he says, Lord, examine me. Lord, judge me. Put me to the test. Lord, investigate my motives. I want to make sure that this mistreatment doesn't cause me to stumble spiritually. That this mistreatment that somebody has done to me doesn't affect me spiritually. You know what David says? Lord, I want an open life before you. I want you to examine me. Can I tell you, I've seen far too many Christians stumble when they've been mistreated. When they even think they've been mistreated. They didn't get the color of the carpet, or they didn't get their wish, or the church didn't decide to do this, or the boss didn't do this, and the boss took somebody else's word for it. But can I tell you, I don't know but of one other person outside the Lord Jesus Christ who was severely mistreated than Joseph. Think of me about Joseph. His brothers didn't like him. They sold him into slavery. He goes down to Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife lies on him. He gets put into jail. While he's in prison, he interprets a dream. And the one guy that he interprets his dream for uh, that told him it was going to be good, he forgets Joseph. And yet we come to the end of jo and we come to the end of Joseph's life, and he sees his brothers again. He says, "You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good." Right. If you've ever been mistreated, whether you deserved it or not, the tendency we need to have is, "Lord, examine me, not him. <laughs> Lord, judge me, not him. Lord." Nail me, not him. But what do we usually do? When somebody's mistreated us, we ask God to judge them. We ask God to nail them. We ask God to deal with them. Hey, listen to me. Don't you worry. Who's going to right all wrongs? God is, but he won't do it on your time. He'll do it on, on his time. So in the process of you waiting on God to make everything right, you need to pray like David. Lord, judge me. Lord, examine me. Lord, check me out. You say, what well, happened if you don't? of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Can I tell you what causes bitterness? A mistreatment. And it's easy for all of us to allow bitterness to get in our heart. Somebody says something we didn't like. Somebody doesn't speak to us 
and I can't use this right now. Somebody didn't shake our hand. Because if you get upset about that, then you got a, you got a real problem. But sometimes people get all upset. I didn't get a phone call. This one didn't speak to me. This one didn't shake my hand. Can I tell you, bitterness is anger harbored in the heart and allowed to fester. And the writer of the book of Hebrews talks about a root of bitterness. And a root is something that is out of sight. Nobody else sees it, but it's there. And it begins in the heart. David has been done wrong by Saul's men. Somebody in Saul's court has slandered him. And David doesn't come to God and ask God to judge them. He says, Lord, such my heart. You say, how do people get bitter? They get bitter when they feel that someone has said or done something wrong to them or, some, or to someone they love. Or maybe they feel like they've been deprived of something or someone they love has been deprived of something that is rightfully theirs, whether it's justifiably or unjustifiably, and they allow that thing to remain in their heart and it festers bitterness. And David cries out to God. He says, God, try me, prove me, search me. He's saying, Lord, search me continually. You're not to let a root of bitterness stay there and spring up. This day, as Paul says, it'll trouble you. Now listen, I cannot control what happens to me, but I can control what happens in me. I cannot control what happens to me. I cannot make you love me. I cannot make you speak kind words. Neither can you, anybody else, but I can control my reaction. And I can control how I react to you. I find in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, David cries out again and says, Search me, O Lord. What he's doing, he says, Lord, I want to be open to your inspection in my life. Church, let me tell you, the devil will use moments of mistreatment to destroy you. He will allow a husband that mistreats you to destroy you spiritually. He will allow somebody at work, you got overlooked for a job promotion, they got the job promotion, and it can ruin you. Bitterness can make you like the lady I've used before who went to see a doctor for an examination. She felt terrible. She felt awful. The doctor examined her, and he got very serious and said, Madam, I hate to tell you this because I know what comes ahead, but you have rabies. She got out a notebook and she started making a list. The doctor said, ma'am, what are you going to do? Are you, are you making out your will? She said, no, but I'm making out a list of people I'm going to bite. Sounds like to me somebody was bitter. David says, examine yourself. Search me. Search me continually. There's a second thing you're going to do. You're going to have to overcome bitterness. You're going to have to exclude yourself. You're going to have to stay clear. Look what he says in Psalm 36 and verses 4 and 5. Look what he says. Where, let me see. i got to get there. Where am I? 26. 4 and 5. He says this. I have not sat with vain persons Neither will I go in with dissimilars. I've hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. What David is saying is, I'm going to exclude myself. I'm going to stay clear of some people that will see my sight. By the way, doesn't that usually happen when somebody has upset you? Don't you usually try to find somebody to take your side? Hmm? Doc's a boss and Doc defended some of his employees. They ain't going to come tell Doc about it. But they're going to tell another employee. And, and, and so discord. You can count on Satan looking for opportunities to get you off track. And when you feel you've been mistreated and you start wearing your, your feelings on your sleeve, Satan moves in and he whispers and he'll say something like this. Can you believe that? You don't deserve being treated like that. They can't get away with it. Then the resentment and the bitterness 
and an unforgiving spirit moves into your heart. And when that happens, joy and happiness goes out the window. I have met, I hate to tell you this, I have met some of the bitterest Christians in all the world. I've met some that are extremely bitter. And you could ask them, what happened? And something happened 35 years ago. And they're still upset and still not in church. We need to be more like David. When he was mistreated, not only did he examine himself, but to make sure that he was right with God, but he excluded himself from people who would pull him down. He said, I've not sat with vain persons. He said, I excluded myself from people whose character was marked by wickedness and emptiness. Friend, when you're mistreated and when you're feeling slighted, the devil will send people your way that are godless as he attempts to get a hold in your life. How many remember Jonah? Jonah made up his mind he was going to flee. God says, go to Nineveh and preach. But he goes down to Tarsus, and he just so happens to find the ship going in the direct opposite direction. You say, who had that ship? The devil had it there for a year. <laughs> David said in this verse, he says in Psalm 26, he said, I've not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. He said, I'm going to exclude myself from people who pretend to be something they're not. They're the kind of people who will sing about Jesus on Sunday and spend the rest of the week deceiving and conniving like the devil. And David says, I'm going to avoid people like that. When I'm hurt, I'm going to stay away from them. Now, why would David exclude himself from people like that? I'll tell you why. He knew that when he was hurt, he was vulnerable. So he says, I've got to stay away from those people that would hurt me and drag me and make it worse. And then in verse number 5 he says, I've hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. He says, I'm not even going to sit with them. Why? Because they'll bring me down. He says, I'm hurt and I've got to exclude myself. And listen, when you've been mistreated and when you're vulnerable, there comes a time and the best thing you can do if you're going to stay true to God is to walk away from certain people and stay away from them. David separated himself from people who had no use for God. The disdainful man, the deceitful man, the degenerate man. God didn't, uh, David didn't want evil people to influence him wrong, so he excluded himself. He avoided spending time with him. I mean, can I tell you, just sometimes when you've been done wrong, the best thing you can do is stay away from people who are going to see your side because it's going to make it worse. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. How many times as a teenager, when they want to do something that their parents told them they couldn't do, can anybody go tell me who they're going to talk to? They don't go talk to another parent. Can anybody tell me who they're going to talk to? Another friend that's their age that's going to see it just like they did. They're going to say, my mom and daddy hurt me. They wouldn't let me do this. And they go talk to John. And John says, yeah, I know. That's exactly, they're wrong. Stay clear. That's, that's how you ensure times of mistreatment. Don't become opportunities for the devil. Bible says don't give place to the devil. And look what David says in Psalm 26, verse 9. He says, Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hand is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. He says, Lord, if you see me leaning toward people like that, uh, 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 do something about it. Keep me from my own folly. When you're mistreated, examine yourself. Search your heart continually. When you're mistreated, exclude yourself. There's some people you're going to have to stay clear of. But there's a third thing David says. He said, when you're mistreated, you've got to express yourself and you've got to speak carefully. Usually when we're mistreated, the last person we go to, if we're a child of God, the last person we go to should have been the first person we went to. When we're mistreated, Brother Campbell, the last person we go to 
would be the Lord, but he should have been the first person that we went to. We'll go tell somebody else what happened now they get drawn into this mistreatment because they only hear one side of the story. You know what happens to a lot of Christians when they're mistreated or treated unfairly by somebody at church? They stop attending public church, worship. You know why? I'll tell you why. Number one, they're spiritual babies. They may have grown old, but they've never grown up. They're more concerned about pleasing themselves rather than God. May I ask you, aren't you glad that when Jesus was mistreated that he didn't decide not to show up at the cross? What would happen if he said, I'm mistreated, they beat me, they've done all this, I'm not showing up at the cross? No, he meant. David's feeling mistreated, and when he begins in verses 6 through 8, he's talking about, he says, I wash my hands in innocence. I will compass thine altar, O Lord. Where is he going? He's going to the Lord. He says, I'm going to publish with the voice of thanksgiving. I'm going to tell them all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thy honor dwelleth. Listen, when you're mistreated, you better express yourself. You better speak carefully. And you better be speaking to the Lord and about the Lord. Look what he says in verse number 12. My foot standeth in an even place, and the congregation will I what? Bless the Lord. I'll praise the Lord. Now, think with me tonight. Many Christians talk about the weather, the jobs, the houses, the cars, the coronavirus. Everything except the Lord. Mistreated and yet still marveling here, David, at the grace and the majesty of God. Can I tell you, when you bring your mistreatment to God, you put things in proper perspective. I've never met anybody that has been as mistreated as the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not say I've not been mistreated. And you cannot say you've not been mistreated. But none of us have reached the status or the level of mistreatment as the Lord did. And let me tell you, he went all the way to the cross even though he's mistreated. He didn't quit. He even said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. If you examine what God's done in the past for you, that will encourage you in the present. My friends may have forsaken me, but the Lord has not God's works of wondrous love. And I tell you, God's works of wondrous of love are wondrous if we consider the unworthiness of the objects of his love. Saints should rejoice to tell of the great things the Lord has done for us. We ought to talk to him and talk for him in the midst of this mistreatment. Expressing yourself in praise to God. Reminds you of what's really important and what's not important. Looking upward when you're facing mistreatment helps you major on the major and rather than majoring on the minor. When you're mistreated, you're oftentimes tempted to pursue getting even, or as some people would say, getting ahead. Most people, when they're mistreated, they don't want to get even. They want to get up. I know you mistreated me, but I want to get up one on you. We want to strike back. We want to retaliate. We want to revenge. Instead of committing it all to God. David expressed himself in praise to God, and he was set free from the bondage of bitterness after he'd been mistreated. I put this in my notes. It's amazing what praising can do. Now, here was David. He's been mistreated. He's been maligned. He's been slandered. What does he do? He examines himself. He didn't examine them. Didn't try to figure out what their motive. He wanted to make sure his motive was what? Correct. I've had to be careful this during this coronavirus. Boy, if 
you're friends with a lot of preachers, you'll understand my wife telling me to get back out of there because you can't see. It's hard. But uh, the, the, you, you hear preachers that get up and rant and rave and say, you ought not to ever close your church and you ought to tell the people they ought to come. And then they criticize those that close the church. And then some would say, well, we'll do it on Facebook or do it this way. And they were criticized. I tried to take the stance Paul did. If the gospel is preached therein, I will rejoice. You'll be maligned, misunderstood. David said, I don't want you to examine them, Lord. You've heard the little thing. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. My wife mistreats me. It's not my job to correct her. I need to make sure my response is right. Can I get an amen? Amen? Oh, yeah. All right, I knew I'd get an amen out there. Uh, and same thing if the husband mistreats you. It's not your job. Listen, you've got to make sure your response is right. Amen? <laughs> i got to get used to that. And then stay, exclude yourself. Stay clear of some people. Let me ask you this. There are some people that I know that if I was going through a difficulty, I sure would not want to be talking to. Anybody know anybody like that? You just wouldn't want to talk to them because I'm going to tell you, they discourage you. They said, when I've been mistreated, there's some people I gotta exclude myself from. I gotta stay clear from them. As a pastor, I have known certain ones in the church down through the years that I did not want to see before I got up here to preach. I didn't mind seeing them at a distance, but if I saw them coming to me, they were usually coming to me, hit me something with broadside, and when they would, I would try to avoid it and go the other way. And I'm glad when my office got back there because I got to a point. I'd come straight from my office, straight into here. Why? Because David said, I got to stay clear. I got to exclude myself. And then he says, I need to express myself. I got to speak carefully. And the one I need to speak to is to the Lord and about the Lord. I promise you, church, you're going to be mistreated. I'm going to be mistreated. Are we any better than the Lord? No, but we can follow the example that David gives us here when he's maligned, when he's misjudged. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you again tonight for the eternal word of God. I dare say there's not a person in this auditorium that has not been mistreated one time or another. Lord, we've all faced it. And I would have to say, Father, I know in my own life, I've not always responded correctly. Sometimes I've asked you, God, to deal with them, and then I sought somebody else that would see my side of the thing when I should have excluded myself from them. And then I began to speak to the wrong person instead of speaking to you and about you. But David gave us an example, a psalm that was written as a result of his mistreatment. Lord, help us to follow his admonition his example, and may we be the better for it. For those that may be listening by Facebook, if you've been mistreated, let me tell you something, the Lord will never mistreat you. He's never mistreated me. He's never failed me. He's always been faithful. And if you need us, you call us at 706-678-1855, 706-318-6642. And let us show you how to deal with this mistreatment. Happens in the workplace, happens in the home, happens all across America. And you know, I got to thinking, if anybody has been slandered in these days in which we live daily, it's probably been the President of the United States of America. I do not know how he's handled it. And sometimes you'll watch him and you'll realize he's not handled it properly, and I would tell him that. But David says, this is the way you handle it. This is the way it should be handled. Take these principles and apply them to your life. We'll ask all these things now in the lovely name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Get out, Brother Doc, Sheriff.